the scariest things that could happen in this world is when someone you know seemingly vanishes without a trace. And what's even scarier is just how many people this has happened to. Welcome back to Most Amazing Friends, I am your host Kennedy and today we are back once again with part 3 of the top 10 missing celebrities we're still trying to find. And this one might just be the spookiest. Let's get started. Up first in the number 10 spot is Jim Robinson. A boxer from Miami, Florida in the 1960s, Sweet Jimmy as he was called in the ring, came into the spotlight after he was the fourth person to professionally fight the great Muhammad Ali. On February 7th, 1961, Cassius Clay, who later became Muhammad Ali, was supposed to be fighting a man named Willie Galat, but Galat ended up turning down the offer after finding out he was going to be paid $500 less than his opponent. So down a fight. The club promoter Chris Dundee, in a last minute switch around, recruited Sweet Jimmy instead. Now, the good news for Robinson was that he got his claim to fame that night. However, the bad news was that Ali outweighed him by 16 and a half pounds and won by a knockout by a minute 34 into the first round. Through the years, Muhammad and Sweet Jimmy remained good friends, though, often seen together around Miami driving around in Ali's pink Cadillac. So you can imagine the shock when, out of nowhere, Robinson was was gone. After retiring in 1963, Robinson came back into the limelight for a quick stint in 68 before finally calling it quits for good. From there, he laid pretty low and lived a normal life until he was tracked down by Sports Illustrated in 1979 for an interview about his life. Little did his writer know though that this would be the last anyone saw Jim Robinson, as ever since that day his whereabouts have been unknown. Ever since, there have been many attempts and investigations by local police least to find him, but sadly, none have proven successful. He quite literally vanished without a trace. Next up at number 9 is Ian McIntosh. After rising up to the rank of Lieutenant Commander in the British Royal Navy, during the 60s and 70s, Ian pivoted passions and began turning the adventures of his Navy career into action novels such as A Slaying in September. After his novels were well received by the masses, Ian tried his hand in the TV biz, writing for shows such as the critical acclaimed BBC drama Warship, as well as Thundercloud and the Sandbaggers. Sadly, however, less than a month before his 39th birthday, Ian disappeared and was never to be seen again. On July 7th, 1969, while on a trip to Alaska with his partner Susan and friend Graham, who was flying the plane, a distress signal was sent out around 6pm by Barbara. Apparently, the plane was approaching the northeast corner of Kodiak Island, and so an air traffic control officer sent sent off the Coast Guard to help. However, when the military arrived at the plane's last reported location, there was no sign of Ian, his plane, or the rest of his crew. Even stranger was that there was no sign of a crash either. There was no debris, no casualties, and no survivors. And even after searching for days, they never got closer to finding where Ian had vanished off to. They quite simply disappeared, and they, along with their plane, were never seen again. Next up at number 8 is Pierre Bianconi. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Pierre Bianconi was one of the biggest high level pro soccer players in France. But what made him so famous wasn't a huge amount of goals or a charming personality that people fell in love with. In fact, you could say he was more notorious than famous. Due to his routinely aggressive and unruly behavior, Pierre racked up countless yellow and red penalty cards over the years, and it seemed that he remained unfazed by the increasingly bad facade he was creating for himself. One incident in particular in 1985 earned him great notoriety after he slapped an opposing player and took the red card that was held up to him by the official, ripped it up, and then proceeded to headbutt the referee. Thankfully, the ref only suffered a bloody nose, but Pierre's penalty was a six month ban from competitive soccer. But of course, what really made Pierre the most famous of all was when he vanished without a trace in 1993. Very little is known about the events surrounding his disappearance, only that Pierre was last spotted in the port city of Bastia in December of 93, where his car was later found without any trace of its owner. Coming in at number 7 is Jimmy Hoffa. From a very young age, Jimmy was a passionate union activist for America's largest union, the International Brotherhood of 
of Teamsters, or IBT. In fact, by his mid-twenties, he began being recognized as a fairly important regional figure, and by 52, he was even elected as the vice president. Fast forward a few years to 1957, and Jimmy had worked his way up to be president of the union, a position he held for 14 years. But the thing about Jimmy was that he was not a straight and narrow kind of man. In fact, he was the exact opposite. Despite being a popular figure, it was well known that Jimmy had his hand in some dangerous pies, and was wrapped up in quite a few illegal activities with the mafia. Eventually, these crimes caught up to him, and in 64, Jimmy was convicted for jury tampering and bribery of a grand juror. But it only got worse from there. While on bail during his appeal, Jimmy was convicted in a second trial, this time for conspiracy and mail and wire fraud. He tried for four years to appeal, but when all was said and done, Jimmy was facing a whopping 13 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. In 1967, he went to jail, still working as the president of the union from the inside, but a mere four years into his sentence, President Nixon pardoned him and allowed him for his release. However, despite being expected to return back to his union duties, Jimmy strangely disappeared. Last seen at a restaurant parking lot in Detroit, neither Jimmy or his body has ever been recovered. There is some speculation that the mafia could have heard of his release and gotten to him, but we will never really know what happened to Jimmy. Coming in at number 6 is Zahir Rahan. A famous novelist in what was at the time called East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, Zahir rose to international fame in 1971 with his 20 minute documentary entitled Stop Genocide. The documentary was released in the middle of the Bangladesh Liberation War and depicted the plight of refugees fleeing the country's war with Pakistan, shining a light on the harsh military regime that killed roughly 3 million people. Now, as you can probably imagine, despite receiving critical acclaim from other parts of the world, there was one place that was not a fan of his spotlight on the war. Pakistan. And unwittingly, Zahir had put himself in the spotlight of some very powerful people. Then in January of 1972, barely a month after the war had ended and Bangladesh was declared independent, Rahan went missing. The most tragic part of it all is that apparently Rahan was actually out looking for his brother, who he believed was abducted by the Pakistani military two days prior, only to vanish himself. Many believe that he was kidnapped along with his brother for supporting Bangladeshi independence but as there's no evidence, witnesses, or body to be found, no one actually knows what happened to the poor man. Coming in at number 5 is John Brisker. In the early 1970s, John was an all-star player in the ABA and worked his way up the ladder until he found himself in the NBA. By 1972, John was playing for the Seattle Supersonics, but soon his stats began to drop below the usual standard. It seems this downhill trajectory developed into a rather aggressive personality and John quickly became known as the man you did not want to be on the wrong side of. In fact, during his professional career, he became notorious for needing to be removed from the court. Over the next two years, his playtime was limited until sadly he was cut from the team in 1975, and little else is known about what happened after he was cut, except that he and his girlfriend had a daughter in 78. Then, later that year, John decided to switch up his career. After a few failed business ideas, John decided he was going to head over to Africa to start an import-export venture. And so he did. Then on April 11th, 1978, John called his girlfriend from Uganda, but that was the last time he was ever heard from. What happened to John remains a mystery to this day. His remains have never been found, and no one has seen him since he left for Uganda. But the strangest part of it all is that the US State Department could not actually confirm if Brisker had even traveled to Africa in the first place, and have gone on record stating that they believe he is still out there somewhere. Coming in at number four is Weldon keys. Throughout his time in the hot seat, it seemed like Weldon was always on the verge of making it big. He knew all the right people, went to all the right parties, and he worked very consistently as a poet, painter, playwright, pianist, and filmmaker. But for whatever reason, he never seemed to really get his name in lights. His greatest success was The Poet Follies, a musical review meets burlesque show that premiered in January of 1955, and although Poet Follies earned him great notoriety, 
his other projects did not find the same kind of support. Then later that year, the permanent home for the Poet Follies was closed by the fire marshal just days before the premiere of a new one act play, devastating Weldon to his core. All this effort, with little to no recognition, began to get to Weldon's head, and that paired with his divorce the year prior, slowly but surely began to send him into a deep depression. By early July, his depression was worsening, and he began talking of running off to Mexico to start a new life and never return. However, no one really took this claim that seriously, believing he was just in a bad headspace. But on July 19th of 1955, Weldon disappeared forever. All that was found was a deserted car near the Golden Gate Bridge his body nowhere in sight. While some assumed he took his own life, the strange part was that his wallet, sleeping bag, and an account savings book with over $800 in it went missing along with him. And the truth of his disappearance remains a mystery to this day. Coming in at number 3, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Author of the famed children's novella The Little Prince, Antoine was not just a writer of fantastical books, but also fancied himself somewhat of a pilot. Although it seems that he may have been been better with the typewriter as he was the victim of not one, but two disappearances while flying an aircraft. The first time it happened was in 1935, and Antoine, along with his mechanical engineer on board, crash landed into the Libyan desert. Despite surviving the crash, the pair had only about one day's worth of fluids, and very limited food. And by the second day, they both began to experience vivid hallucinations from dehydration. However, after four days, and on the brink of death, the pair were found by a Bedouin and returned back to safety. Believe it or not, this did not seem to deter Antoine from flying, and in World War II, desperate to do his part for his country, he volunteered his skills as a pilot for the Allies. However, it was quickly discovered he was not quite up to par with the other pilots, often crashing into trees or winding up in the wrong coordinates. Eventually, he became a pretty big liability to the Allies, but still he insisted on doing his part for the greater good. But on his 10th mission in July of 1944, Antoine took off over the Mediterranean and was never seen again. It is debated that his flight may have crashed, but neither him or his body has ever been found, so no one truly knows what happened to him that fateful day. Coming in at number 2 is Barbara Follett. Barbara became a household name when in 1927, at just 12 years old, she published her first novel, The House Without Windows. Lucky for her, her father was the editor of a publishing company, and so with his help, her novel was sent out into the world. Incredibly, the young writer received critically acclaimed reviews from the New York Times, among other companies, and everyone that read her novel agreed that young Barbara was going to be the next great American novelist. And to her credit, she kind of was. Two years later, she published another novel entitled The Voyage of the Normandy, once again with rave reviews across the board. However, sadly, after the second novel's release, her father abandoned both her and her mother for another woman, leaving them virtually penniless in the midst of the Great Depression. By age 16, she worked as a typist, trying to scrape by like everyone else, until 1931 when she met her soon-to-be husband, Nick Rogers. After a few years of travel, the pair settled down and married in 1934, and although initially happy, by 1937 she was beginning to express her dissatisfaction to close friends, believing that her beloved was being unfaithful. Then on December 9th, 1939, after an argument with her husband, Barbara left the house with $30 to her name, an equivalent of like 500 bucks, and was never seen again. But what is especially mysterious is that her husband didn't report her missing for two whole weeks. And even then, the media wasn't clued into the disaster until 1966. The mother was famous for believing that the investigation was not thorough enough, but to this day, her body has never been recovered, and police were never able to figure out where Barbara ran away to. Last up in our number one spot is Elenia Carisi. From the moment Elenia was brought into this world, she was already pretty much famous. Born in 1970 to hugely famous Italian singers Albano and Romina Carisi, it wasn't long before Elenia joined the family biz and began working as an entertainer herself. By 1984, the young performer made her debut in an Italian film, Champagne in Paradiso, which coincidentally starred both her parents before later appearing in 19. 
1989 as the letter turner for the Italian version of the Wheel of Fortune. However, Elenia's real dream was to be a writer, so in college she decided to study literature, which as it turns out, she was really, really good at. However, as many people in their early 20s do, Elenia decided to take a break from her studies and travel solo around the world with nothing but a backpack and a journal. She began in South America and worked her way up to Belize where she stayed for a few months. Then on Boxing Day of 1993, she got on a bus and headed for New Orleans, Louisiana. But tragically, weeks later in January of 94, 23 year old Elenia was gone and no one knew where to find her. She had last been spotted in the haunted French Quarter and despite the local authorities great efforts, neither her nor any remains were ever recovered. Well, there you have it guys. I hope you liked this video. If you did, make sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll catch you next time.